Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. Your host, Ken Lane, here every week in the mountains of Arizona. We're just, it's autumn. It's beautiful. A couple things you should be noticing right now is the autumn colors that started early, they're starting to be all naked. They're deciduous. Deciduous means they lose their leaves in the winter. Evergreen is they hold their foliage. They may not necessarily be green all the time. Some some evergreens turn gray. They turn purple. They turn uh, reds and and uh, burgundies. They're just different colors, but they hold their leaves year-round. Deciduous, whether it's a shrub or a tree, loses their leaves through winter. They need to rest. This, many of the blooming plants like lilacs and forsythia and, and a rose of Sharon and crepe myrtles, these are things that need to rest. They put all this energy into blooming, blooming, blooming. And then they need to kind of hibernate, kind of like a squirrel or a bear. They need to kind of let go, just kind of reset, gather their energy, rest for a bit, and then come back next spring with vengeance and do it all over again. The evergreens, they don't need to do that as much. They tend to rest right after they're done elongating. So a uh, spruce tree, now's the time to plant spruce and, and pines and firs and junipers. This is the peak time. Well, they tend to rest uh, from spring, summer through winter. And then they put all of their energy into bursting with new growth. They generally only, they only grow one time. So a spruce tree will grow about 18 inches a year. If it's truly happy, maybe a little bit more. If it's not quite happy, maybe a little less, but about 18 inches. It's going to push that growth in the spring. And whatever you get for the spring, that's all you're going to get for the entire year. And then it rests for the rest of the year. It actually doesn't just rest. It actually thickens up those new, new needles. Uh, they, they become waxy. They kind of protect themselves. And that's where they're so winter hardy. Uh, they're just so robust because they've been hardening themselves off from summer through autumn through winter. And then they're forming right now new, new uh, I call them leaf buds. So new buttons on the ends of those branches. That's the bigger that button can be, the more growth you're going to have next spring. And so things are in transition right now. Uh, that's also the spruce trees. That's why you're putting those in now. So they'll continue. They'll root out some through the end of the year. Then they're going to flush all of this new growth. And from the farm, I mean, we've really juiced them. We've kind of got them. We want them green and rich and healthy so that when they do burst with new growth next spring, you get maximum growth. And then right after that new candle growth of a pine tree or a spruce or a fir or whatever that evergreen is, the bigger that that elongated growth is, the more the roots you get. It's just a really good, good way to go. Deciduous plants, they need to hibernate, so just kind of rest for a bit. And then right now you are noticing many, many leaf buds and flower buds. So I noticed my, my uh, peach tree, it's just, it's got a few leaves left. It's definitely gold. Uh, I'd say your, your apricots and your nectarines, they're all in the same league. They're on the same, they're, they're related to each other. They're kind of, finishing up. But when the leaves fall off, you'll notice, look closely at the branches and you'll see little nodes, little buttons, little uh, little nodules. That That is the flower bud for next spring. It's a flower or a leaf bud. One of those two, generally for, for fruit trees, that's a, that's a flower bud. The more of those you have, the more potential for fruit. It's been a tremendous fruit year this year. Just lots of apples coming off right now. Lots of pears coming off right now. So that's that's why you're planting those now so that they can get get adjusted to their new new home i'd say uh and then they're going to erupt with new flower buds and form new fruits next spring and so the secret with those don't be alarmed when they lose their leaves this is for you you tropical folks the hawaii the Southern California, the, the, the south of Arizona, they're not used to things losing their leaves. It's okay. It's natural. They need to do this. If you're seeing some yellow on your plants, so not just fall color, but let's say your evergreens like privets and red tip photinia, 
Ketoniasters. All of these, we call them broadleaf evergreens. They're the ones that are most noticeable. If they've got any amount of yellow on them right now, they should not. That is not healthy. Usually what that is, that is a lack of nutrients. And so they've, they're starving to death. And so those plants that have yellow on them right now, uh, they won't form nice leaf buds. They won't have good, good flower buds. And so if you've not fertilized in the last six months or so, you'll see this. Or if you've been watering like crazy, all that food you gave it back last spring has flushed out and now it is actually gone. And so the plant is it's, it's saying, hey, I'm emaciated. I'm, I'm getting pale. I need some help here. Watch after me. Could you help? And so you just give them some, some granular food. So the uh, all-purpose plant food, 744 all-purpose plant food is the best stuff ever. Give it some of that and it will green back up. It'll, it'll get you more leaf buds, more flower buds. The fertilizing in autumn is the most important bar none. I mean, just, I can't emphasize that enough because of this whole sequence of I'm forming next spring's flower and leaf buds. Or if it's an evergreen, it's forming that new button. And the bigger that elongation of that new node on the end of that branch gets, the more roots you get, the hardier it is, the deeper it is, the more drought robust, just kind of, there's a lot going on for it. You folks with new landscapes, it's even more important. So new landscapes, because the roots just really haven't, you put in a, let's say a five gallon plant, it's kind of the standard tree or a 15 gallon tree. That bucket, all the roots that that, that that plant knows are inside that bucket. They need to elongate outside that and get into that surrounding soil. And then all of a sudden it will be very happy next spring when it gets a hundred degrees next end of June, first part of July, you know, when the summer is, it will be It'll go through that like it was nothing. It'll just be happy with that. You won't have to water every day because it's got roots all over the place. You can water once a week and it'll be just fine. And so right now, uh, your, your, your landscapers are, are adjusting water. And so if you are, if they've done that and you've got brand new plants, you still, those brand new plants, because that root is still still defined by the bucket. It hasn't elongated out. Those, those roots should go out three, four, five, six feet away from where that original plant roots were. If that's the case, they're going to be more dependent on you through winter. They're going to need some supplementing this winter. So I'm telling folks right now, uh, if you as soon as you turn that irrigation off, sometime in November, we tend to throttle back. So as plants lose their leaves, they don't need as much water. They still need water. Here in Arizona, they never shut down. It's not like the Midwest. You Mid Midwest folks, you, you don't, we don't have a frost line here. I mean, the code says your, your water pipes and sewer pipes need to be 18 inches under the ground. That's barely scratching the surface. Some of you folks from Wisconsin, you've got eight, six foot, eight foot water lines. You're down so deep because the ground freezes. We don't do that here. And because of that, your plants, that sap will still flow even in midwinter, even in January. I mean, it was 12 degrees last night, but it will be 55, 60 degrees this afternoon. That's why it's so beautiful here. I mean, even middle of the day, it's still bright and sunny. You still see the blue sky. You can still go out and you know, the couple layers go out and hike around and just enjoy the outdoors. That's the beauty of Arizona, especially the mountains of Arizona. It's the best. And your plants are happy with it, too. So you'll find that they tend to still form those buds. They'll be slower. But they're still forming. They're still growing. They're still, they're still. That sap is still flowing and feeding next springs, next March into February. First part of March is when you see spring hit here in in the Central Highlands. I call it. Uh, let's say it's Cortis Junction to Prescott Valley, Dewey, Chino Valley, Paulden, uh, Prescott, of course, uh, all over the mountain towards Kirkland. Uh, uh, Skull Valley, those are hillside. That's where all the central highlands, we're all the same elevation. I would even include, and some of you types, you folks on the other side of the mountain, you think you're more special than we are. You're not, you're the same. Camp Verde, Cottonwood, Sedona, you're the same. We're all the same. We're all the central highlands. We're the same. So the plants will start to wake up sometime after Valentine's Day, and then it goes from there. So it's usually the daffodils are starting to bloom, especially on that eastern slope. On the Mingus, that's that cotton with Jerome, those areas, Sedona, where you get some of those, those warm 
rocks up there. They start to take off early. And so by the end of February, you're seeing, oh, it's spring's here. It's getting ready. Uh, so th th the spring bloomers are starting to really go. And then it's forsythia head, then it's lilacs bloom, and then it's roses head. And then it's just it's a progression right after that. But they're deciduous. They need to rest for a bit. There, that's the end of the first segment. We will be right back after this with more important garden tips, tricks, and garden advice. For luxurious evergreens in the yard, look no further than waters. We have a luscious selection of evergreens that look their best in winter, so you can enjoy a beautiful landscape no matter the cold. Locally grown for stunning appearance and ability to thrive in cold weather. Perfect for that touch of luxury your neighbors are sure to be jealous of. Luxurious evergreens at Waters Garden Center in Prescott and watersgardencenter.com. Your one-stop shop for evergreens. Visit us today. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. All right, so Ken and Lisa Lane, the Mountain Gardeners. In this segment, Lisa just brings garden questions. What's What are your neighbors talking about that maybe we can share that would help you in your own backyard as well? So welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. You're looking fabulous, my dear. Fabulous. <laughs> and you look fall ready. I can see myself oh, on yeah. the camera and I can tell you. <laughs> the great thing about audio, the, the terrestrial towers, they can't, all they hear are the voices, but we're, we're starting to do this by video as well mm -hmm. for vlogging or whatever. And right. you, you do have to watch what you, <laughs> how you look more often. <laughs> Allergies still bothering you? They are right, we going crazy. I get a little it's, tinge too. I think it's yeah. the wind or the dust or mold. I have no idea. It's something fall is yeah. in the air, yeah. but uh, suck on a little bit of coffee, hot tea, and it kind of helps. I've never had allergies. I've lived here my entire life. Never had allergies till about two years ago. Yep. Till it's COVID. Scary. It's COVID's <laughs> fault. Everything is COVID's fault. <laughs> I always tell people, I don't have COVID. I promise. It's just allergies. because I feel fine. Nothing's yep. wrong. But yeah, my voice and a cough. Or... Well, you look fine. Well, <laughs> okay. To this old guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the man who's going blind and wears one contact. <laughs> okay. So anyway, customers, we've had a couple customers in this week and they're going, no, no. We, I really enjoy listening to you all, but oh, yeah. you laugh so much that it's hard to follow what you're saying sometimes. So uh, clean it up. <laughs> no, they're very kind. Yeah. So we're just having too much fun mm -hmm. on the airwaves. We Pretty get a little much. carried away sometimes. Sometimes. It's better to have fun and oh yeah, and be, be misunderstood than to not <laughs> have fun and be a, be understood. We don't want to be profound. I think I think Ben Franklin said that. Oh sure, that. sounds like something. Mark Twain. <laughs> you put you put their names on either on any statement. It sounds good, no matter yeah, what. Yeah, it's an know. affirmation. Yeah. yeah. So garden questions. Yeah. What are we talking about? Well, so Mark really wants to put a Vanderwolf pine in Love his it. yard. That's great. And he was told, be careful, watch for drainage. They're very sensitive to that. Yeah. So he did a test hole. Took forty eight hours for the water to drain oh out gosh. of there. Okay. Wants to know. What do you think? Should I do it? Should I yeah. not find another spot? Yeah. So What's Vanderwolf pines are so so <laughs> pines. Pines do really well in northern Arizona. And then most of the listeners here are tuning in from northern Arizona. Um they do not, I mean, they adapt well because it's dry, it's arid, it's bright, it's high altitude, extreme temperature swings, everything that pine trees love. We have it here except for soils that don't drain. And so if it drained within, I was hoping for 12 hours, they go, yeah, go fine. You're fine. Don't worry about it. You're overthinking this. Two days to get the water out of the hole. That's a lot, especially in, in the monsoon patterns. Yeah. There's two times when we get real wet here. March, the first part of April, you get these real heavy wet snows that take weeks to, to melt and dis mm -hmm. disappear. You see damage on evergreens then. And the monsoons, uh, August, September, lots of rain uh, consistently, multiple times a week where the whole, you know, you'll get rain more than every two days. And so the plant never gets a chance to breathe. Mm -hmm. Pines don't like that. 
what can you do for this hole? So, so it was Mark, right? right. Mark, don't plant a Vanderwolf pine in that <laughs> hole as it is. Change it up. Now, what we do is what we, we create in the industry, we call it a chimney. Mm -hmm. We'll take a piece of that hole and we'll try to dig it to the next soil band, the next layer of, of earth. Mm -hmm. And you'll see when you're driving down the road, you'll see <clears> these <throat> big earth cuts and you'll see different bands, different right. layers of, of soils. Well, you've got that in your yard too. You just want to try to dig down to the next layer and all of a sudden the plant will start draining. You can take a digging bar, a jackhammer, just, just a shovel and try to dig out a peck out a piece. When you see the soil texture change, test it again. My guess is it will now, now breathe, will drain, plant your hole then. The other tip I can give you, and this is what, what I learned years ago, plant on a slight mound. Mm -hmm. So leave, don't <clears throat> plant, whatever you do, don't plant in a divot, no matter yeah. where you're talking about in Northern Arizona. Don't, don't, don't put it in a, in a hole. That's what they do down in Phoenix where it's 110 degrees out in June and it's midnight. It's just hot. <laughs> so here we, we, we cool down. And so right. plants and we get more, much more moisture. So you want the plant, the top of the root ball to be at soil level or even a little above then mound that soil out to be above would be critical for this Vanderwolf or pretty much any evergreen, no evergreen likes soggy, wet soil. Right. And so to leave, <clears throat> two, three, four inches of the root ball out of the ground and then take some of this extra mulch, extra soil, topsoil, and then mound some dirt up. So, you, so when you finish, I don't see exposed root, but I see a slight mound. It's tapered. So it's hardly, no one will see it except maybe you, the, the, the gardener, and then put your irrigation on top of that mound. Put your, put your water basin around that at the outside edge. And that will guarantee that at least three, four inches of the root ball can breathe. Mm -hmm. That's a game changer. Your mortality rate will drop dramatically mm -hmm. just with that technique. Uh, but but the way it currently is, what the question was posed, took two days for, for my soil to, should I plant it there? The question is, the answer is no. no. Unless you modify the hole or change it or raise bed or another part of the yard. Uh, so just, they're so sensitive to, to yeah. which makes them drought hardy. They're right. tough. They go through drought and hot and heat, low water. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of things going for them, but soggy soil ain't one of them. Right. So beware with that one. All right. Next question is from Don. He says, I think I heard you say to prune lilacs, not to prune lilacs this time of year. Okay. He said, if that's true, my maintenance man didn't get the same information. <laughs> get the memo. <laughs> he wants to know, is there anything uh, you can do yeah. at this point or is the year? So have your wife go outside. <clears throat> the maintenance guys are out there. Have her, have her hold them <laughs> while you can slap them because they just totally blundered the whole thing. There's no recovery at this point. So that is not going to affect the health. Right of the lilac or your spring bloomers. It doesn't affect that at all. It just won't bloom. Yeah. So when they pruned it back this time of year, they cut off the flower bud that's been forming for four or five months. Mm -hmm. Now, is there enough time to possibly have new leaf of flower buds to form? It would be worth a try. I would try it. Or can we bulk up the flower buds that remain, let's say there were some down towards the heart, the inside of that shrub or off to the sides. Many times they'll cut back the top trying to get it down. And so you'll see these butchered lilacs, they bloom off to the sides and yeah. not up to the top. It looks kind of like, like a Dr. Right. Seuss lilac or something. Mm -hmm. But but what I would do is I would fertilize that with the all-purpose plant food right away, like right now. And then I would get a, a bag of super phosphate specifically for them, mm -hmm. add super phosphate to the fertilizer, super phosphate 080, that middle number forms flowers. And so put that on there, pray for the rain and snow through the winter. And you'll find out here next end of March and April, right. whether it worked or how much it worked or if, and, and what that will do is you'll get great foliage and the few flower buds that are there will, will bulk up and you might get some additional flower buds and then train your, your staff next, train your gardener. Don't you prune lilacs in, in April and May. You don't prune them in November. Come on. Right. Anyway. Probably May. Yeah, that was bad. 
but just, maybe you can recover. It's okay. Okay. It'll be beautiful. Just won't blow <laughs> yeah. So Barb would like to know she had a 10 by 10 patch of wildflowers. That was yeah. beautiful. Of course, it's kind of reached the end of a season. Yeah. She wants to know if she can just take a weed whacker or a mower and go over that. And if now's the time to do it. Yeah, you can do that right now. It'd be perfectly fine. So for our wild, wildflowers, what we're going to do is I've got a beautiful patch just outside the studio here. Mm -hmm. It's it's way bigger than 10 by 10. Yeah. And it's fun to look out the studio while I'm writing garden columns and, and watch the birds, butterflies out there. It's just magical. Mm -hmm. Wildflowers do really well here. I'm going to leave that patch um, for the birds as long as I can. Sure. I'll probably leave it out there because the cone flowers, the Mexican hats, mm -hmm. the echinaceas, they're all fabulous and great seed sources for right. the birds. Right. Um, and then I'll probably go back and just weed whack that or mow it aggressively. Um, probably in January, February, March, sometime when it just looks so ratty and I've got nothing to do and I <laughs> kind of want to go garden and mm -hmm. it's a nice warm day in January, I'll probably take the mower out there and just mow it or weed whack it. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking of my birds specifically. Good I'll idea. keep it out there for them. Okay. But if you really wanted to, yes, you could do it right now. No problem. Go for it. And so anytime between now and March, prune it back at your at your leisure. Good. Ken Lisa Lane, the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back after this. Grow extraordinary succulents and cactus indoors. Water succulents are easy with lots of shapes, sizes, and colors. Whether you're looking for a small cactus for an office desk or a huge statement succulent in your living room, we have the perfect plant. So what are you waiting for? Visit Waters Garden Center in Prescott today or watersgardencenter.com to find the perfect succulent for your home and office. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. So where I'm getting a lot of folks asking, when should I prune back? When should I cut back my flowers? When should I prune back my shrubs? The things are deciduous. When should I, when should I? They're, they're anxious. There's the, the, the problem is the days are still really nice and your gardens are kind of going to sleep. So you want to be out there still doing stuff. So the tomatoes kind of, mine took it in the chin with that cold last week. They're not going to produce anymore. So as soon as you pick that last fruit off, just pull it out of the ground. You're fine. Uh, veggies, your summer vegetables, kind of that way. So your things that form a fruit are your summer vegetables. They don't like the frost. And so this cold, they're not going to, they're not going to be happy. They're going to let you know, or just turn black and die. So those, you can pick that last watermelon, get that last squash, get the last cucumbers, and then pull the plant out of the ground and expose the soil to the cold. That is going to reduce disease, going to get rid of insects that are kind of heart wintering over. You want that ground not, not covered up in dead plants where things can kind of get underneath there. It's like insulation. It keep, makes sure they come back and get you next year. So leave it exposed. I even take my, I, I, I clean up the gardens and I'll actually put my manure down. So I like a two to three inch layer of manure on top of my vegetable gardens, especially, or my annual flower beds. And I'll let that rest on that ground until I plant next year. Usually March, I'm starting to plant potatoes and planting uh, lettuce, cucumbers, not cucumbers, lettuce, things that you're, for, you're harvesting the, the leaves or the flower head, like broccoli. That's a flower you're eating. That's why it's so delicious. Cauliflower, that's a flower you're eating. You eat, so those, those things are cold. They like the cool. They don't like the heat. The heat stuff, they're kind of done right now. That's why they turn black on you. Frost got them. It's happened in one night, vaporized, unless you were protecting them. Or, or you folks that cheat, you've got greenhouses. That's just wrong. I mean, that's not, that's, that's, I'm just jealous. <laughs> so that's good stuff. So you were, you were protected. You were okay. Those of us that are growing outdoors, yeah, we, the frost got us, um, uh, depending on your elevation, the frost kind of took them out. If not, they're coming your way pretty quick. So the la the, the average first frost date for the mountains of Arizona all the areas. So, so if you're tuned in in your area, I don't know, yeah, but I'm from Sedona. 
that doesn't matter. You're the same. Um, cottonwoods. I've got to be on the river. I've, I've got to be. I've got to be specialer than you. Uh, Prescott, uh, Dewey, uh, um, Humboldt, uh, the folks out in Paulden. Uh, you, we're all the same. Our last, our first frost date, first frost event, typically, this is 100 years of data, is October 28th. So that's about Halloween. So, okay, so if you're a little bit lower elevation, let's say you're 4,000 foot level. So that's the that's Skull Valleys, Kirklands, the, the Cottonwoods, those here. Okay, maybe you're November 2nd. A couple days later, it's really that much more. If you're up in Groom Creek, uh, Highland Pines, uh, the Ridge Lines, maybe you're October 20th instead of the 28th. Maybe you're a few days ahead. But pretty much the local gardeners in the Central Highlands area, we we tend to use Halloween as the, we need to be careful. If you want to keep things going, frost could show up at any time. Keep the sheets available. We want to keep those tomatoes. Pick the last cucumbers. Uh, so we always have that. Our guard is up. In spring, our last frost is Typically, the locals use Mother's Day as that. It's actually technically May 8. That's our 100 years of data. It tends to land on May 8. What that really means is that sometimes it's the end of April. You never know quite know if it's, it's an early spring or sometimes I've seen it snow on Mother's Day. Sometimes it's in the middle, closer towards Memorial Day. Now, you folks up in the real cold areas, maybe your, your you know, Flagstaff, Williams, you tuned in from the White Mountains. Maybe you're, you are Memorial Day, so you're definitely at that higher elevation. The main thing to watch, pruning-wise, so your shrubs, especially new things, leave that structure, that plant. I know the leaves dropped off, but that branch structure protects the core of that plant, the heart of the plant. It keeps the cold off. It warms up. So those branches catch the rays of the sun. They keep the, 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 the crown of that plant warm. And so don't be tempted to prune things back right back to the ground like you will. Usually I'm waiting on my, let's say, autumn sage, Russian sage, uh, my, my lavenders, uh, rosemaries. I'm not going to cut those things back until after the cold of winter is done. So I'm going to wait till March. It's not too late. It's actually right on time. It's actually the best month to really do a lot of pruning because you've got the structure intact. And so the, for trees, March is better because it, the, the branches can kind of help shade some of the trunk areas. So it helps protect it from sun skull. There's some things that happen where the sun warms up the sap in the, in the trunk, starts to flow, and then it gets really cold real quick. And then it, it, this, there's this cracking that happens on the branches, usually in February or March. So if you wait until you get let the cold do its thing, it'll protect the plants and you'll have less loss you'll have a healthier plant next spring. You'll have more growth. you have better blooms, especially for your spring bloomers. Don't be tempted to prune back. Your spring blooming lilacs, forsythia, rhododendrons, azaleas, you'll prune the, you'll prune, it, you can, but you'll prune all the flowers off. So the buds are forming right now. Camellias, we actually have some in bloom here at the garden center. So if you do pruning now, it'll, you'll prune the flowers off. The health of the plant will be fine, but you don't get to enjoy the flowers. So don't be, don't be rushed. Take your time. We're not in a hurry. It's winter. We can we can take a slower pace in, in our gardens. Got more more in store for you. Be right back after this. Your yard will turn heads with stunning evergreen shrubs from Waters Garden Center. Waters grows greener shrubs for year-round interest, as well as blooming shrubs for pops of color in spring. Attract birds with a tall privacy hedge and the berries that follow. Plus, winter evergreens are easier to grow than other plants. No matter your landscape, we have the perfect shrubs for a greener winter. Visit Waters Garden Center in Prescott or online at watersgardencenter.com. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding with a few Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. older individuals they're coming in, they're talking to you and they're well it's, is there they're wondering if you know enough well is there someone else that is maybe a man here <laughs> you see this weird <laughs> cultural thing that happens and when you, you're talking to a person's foremost knowledge of the entire probably 
state, at least for the Central Highlands. It knows plants. She grew up in the business. And then I see that a little bit with our kids. They were the same. They're in their you know late 20s. They've been in the business since they were, were in diapers. They know more than most gardeners, master gardeners know. Mm -hmm. And they're going, well, you're just too young. <clears throat> Give me someone else. I'm going, <laughs> okay, yeah. whatever makes you comfortable, we're here for you. <laughs> and I would say in addition to that, our staff is very well educated, oh. very knowledgeable. Yeah. Uh, we've got two of them that are three, three that are Arizona certified nursery people, um, which is a huge that's thing. That's hard to, to get. That's yeah. hard. There's five of us because you and I count oh, too, you know. I There's know five of us. <laughs> Most garden centers don't even have one. Right. And we got five. <clears throat> this is where you know the Latin name, the, the common name, how to design it into a landscape for the proper spacing, how mm -hmm. it's going to grow, how it's going to look one year, five year, 10 year. It's intense. The the it's like the bar. If you're an attorney, it takes all day to actually take mm -hmm. this test to be approved or not approved. And so it's just right. yeah, Arizona certified nursery professional. Professional. It's pretty intense. Yeah. So we have five on staff, yeah. and then just our our staff is very knowledgeable. We do a lot of training. We do a lot to inform them that so they can help our customers, and that it's sort of important for people to know. It's not just you and I that have all oh, the no. knowledge. Or, no. It's the staff. I mean, I'm the weak them. link in the whole place because I'm running. <laughs> if the electricity goes down, or attorneys need to kind of, or accountants are doing, or or looking at supply chain and talking to vendors and what's going to come down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was delivered yesterday. <laughs> they do, so they're more in tune with the rhythm day to day. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm more the rhythm of the seasonality of stuff. There so you go. anyway, yeah, good point. And I don't even know where that came up with, but anyway. Glad I'm here working with you, and yeah. I respect your knowledge well, of what you. what you bring to the table. I respect you too, dear. Well, thank you. So tell me how <laughs> how do you respect me the most? Let's go deeper knew, into this. I could have bet a hundred dollars. Every that man you that's would tuned that. in right now is wanting the same thing from his significant other, and we just want to know. <laughs> anyway, we oh. let's go to gardening. Yeah, women, <laughs> women feel my pain. On me. All right. So last week we talked about evergreen shrubs and yeah. how important they are to have those evergreens in yeah. your yard. This week we'll cover the trees. Okay, so perfect. The, the trees just, of winter. There it's time. Yeah, yeah, so definitely those evergreen trees that fill the space that you need in the wintertime in your yard. So I kind of divided it into sections. And I thought I'd start with pines. Okay. Because uh, right now we have some gorgeous Austrian pines yeah, in the yard. So if you're looking for a, a nice evergreen, get some good size to it. 30, 35 feet, yeah. 15, 20 feet wide. Um, fast grower, I would say of the pines, they're probably one of the fastest. Would you agree If not the fast, you can get a couple <clears throat> feet a year out of them. That's fast for any plant, right. but especially for evergreens. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. that's the Austrian pine, also known as the Austrian black pine, black pine. yeah, Pinus negris, right? Yeah, oh, very good, dear. You showed black you Latin. Pine. Latin says pine. <laughs> Pinus is pine, <laughs> negris is black. Yeah, black okay. pine. <laughs> There's also the Bosnian pine, which um, they're all kind of cousins of each other. Yeah. So a little bit shorter needle, not quite as big a tree. Right, yeah, half size. Uh, and it's maturity, but another really one that does well. And then my favorite, which is the Oregon green pine. Oh. And I love this one because it fits into those smaller yards. Um, gets maybe 15 feet tall, yeah. five to eight feet wide. It has a shorter needle to it than the Austrian, but it's very dense, yeah. very lush. Super and that green. green is just, wow, yeah. it's green. So nice little tree for a lot of the yards around here. And all those you have in <clears> stock <throat> right now. So they're, mm -hmm. they're, of course, we're building up a lot like the Oregon green. Right. That makes a good Christmas tree. It's just so oh, perfectly sure. layered, shorter needle, dense. Mm -hmm. Just screams, you know, hug me. Of course, it's kind of pokey, but just, <laughs> well, it looks there. Fuzzy. There is one you can hug. Okay, uh, is the Vanderwolf pine oh, good? So we do have some lovely Vanderwolves and kind of a variegated needle on it. We always kind of call it the teddy bear tree because you do you could go stroke it, hug it, and it's not going to poke on you. Yeah. Uh, so that's it looks like it's it's a pine tree that went to the hair <laughs> salon, called it hairdresser, <laughs> and got it got a do. Came back yeah. and went. 
plant me. It's, yeah. It looks like that because you, you can't go buy it without touching it right. going, oh, admiring it. Mm -hmm. It really is a pretty one. Um, of course, the spruce, they do quite well in our area as well. The Colorado blue spruce is probably Sick. one that most people are familiar with. Um, they have come out with the baby blue, which really is a beautiful blue uh, for the, the spruce. It really keeps its color. It has that real silvery blue. Um, little smaller there again yeah. uh for compared to the colorado spruce but a really pretty tree i'm very impressed with how their uniformity and their size and their color it looks like a <clears throat> christmas tree mm -hmm. only it's got bright silver you put little christmas lights on that out in the yard or you know miniature oh, lights beautiful. the thing is going to glow at night mm -hmm. it's so silvery blue and the needles are, are about the same length but there's more of them yeah. So it keeps, he has this perfect shape to it. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, Colorado spruce, it's a great tree. It's the fastest growing of all the spruce, but it's too big for most yards. Yeah, the is. baby blue eyes, the backer eyes, mm -hmm. some of these others, fat Albert spruce, mm -hmm. they're so much, they're uniform, they're, they're brighter colored yeah. and they don't get so doggone big. Easier in the so, landscape. Yeah. Definitely. And they're just as hardy as all the, as the native Colorado mm -hmm. spruce. Um, Black Hill Spruce, yep. which is another nice uh, short needle green, uh, a little on the slower growing side. And then, of course, Alberta Spruce, which is great if you're looking for a, a living tree or you like to decorate out in your yard. Yeah. They do tremendous in containers um, because they're so slow growing. They're easy to grow in a container. Yeah. You had some come in. They were the <clears> biggest oh, ones gorgeous. I've ever seen. They're taller yeah. than I am. Yeah. For an Alberta Spruce, this is a, this, if you've got really green thumbs, it might grow three inches a year <laughs> this thing is now taller and i am think how old this tree is yeah it's like instantaneous mm -hmm. spec spectacle yeah. it's just beautiful to get them that size is unusual and they are beautiful yeah i would agree and only found at waters garden, at waters garden center. center yeah truly that's, that's truly <laughs> that's the case truly yeah right right so then we kind of went into the cypress um so we have the Blue Ice Arizona Cypress nice. does very well. Very pretty tree. We have one from uh, called Chaparral, which is a little more of a sagey green Arizona Cypress. Yeah. Uh, really nicely out there. We have Deodore Cedars and then Atlas Cedar. Uh, you, which... should, you should explain Atlas because most people don't know what that is. <laughs> so it's... Well, the, the Atlas, I think there's a huge one down at the courthouse. Yes, the, it's there? the statehood yeah. tree down on the right downtown Prescott on the courthouse. Mm -hmm. That is the statehood tree. They planted two of them back in 1914, and now they're like towering above the elm trees. Yeah, I don't think people even really see them sometimes. They're so big. They're so big. It's huge. <laughs> Um, but we also have those in a serpentine, so they've trained it to do like yeah. an S shape, and then also weeping, where it just kind of bends over and grows down. I love those; I think they're spectacular. Yeah. Uh, but nice silvery blue, um, just a really nice little layered tree. I think they're beautiful. Drought hardy as all mm -hmm. get out, and I'm sure that the original tree was brought <clears throat> by Conestoga wagon from the East Coast, well, probably by 1914 by, by train from the East Coast. <laughs> they brought them in and. And they planted it there uh, yeah. and it just kept going. So, you know, mm -hmm. they're tough. Right. So, but but all, all this, the Arizona cypress, that icy blue, the bright silver blue. So pretty. That is the prettiest native mm -hmm. you could plant out there yeah. that's so robust, that's this bright colored. Mm -hmm. So all those can be planted now. In fact, yep. this, you have your best selection of evergreens you can plant mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. It doesn't spring. We won't have this many evergreens that you can plant because it's time to put them in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so we've dedicated more space. We can get more of them this time of year. Right. Thank you, Lisa. Out of time, just like that. Yeah. You know, a list of 10 evergreens, and there we go. Ken and Lisa Lane, the mountain gardeners, and talking about evergreen trees. Be right back. More luxurious evergreens in the yard. Look no further than waters. We have a luscious selection of evergreens that look their best in winter, so you can enjoy a beautiful landscape no matter the cold. Locally grown for stunning appearance and ability to thrive in cold weather. Perfect for that touch of luxury your neighbors are sure to be jealous of. Luxurious Evergreens at Waters Garden Center in Prescott and watersgardencenter.com. Your one-stop shop for evergreens. Visit us today.
Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. So in autumn, we tend to find that uh, now through winter, really, but it starts now that deer and rabbit tend to eat more things than you're used to. Uh, It's kind of, you're seeing some pressure there. So some of their things that they like to eat were that frost as they, as they go dormant, they're going, Hey, where's the stuff? Where's my favorite stuff? It's no longer here. It doesn't taste as good. It's more brittle. What's going on? Or the nutrients aren't there. They've all reverted back. So a lot of perennials, they hibernate underground. And so their top growth goes brown. And so they're after that sweet, juicy, sappy, soft, delicious uh, top growth. But now it's now it's hibernate underground. So now they'll they'll mosey around the yard, your gardens, your uh, the neighborhood, trying out new things. And so there's some plants I thought I would just touch on some techniques to keep deer and rabbits out. Um, and then maybe some plants that are less prone to that. So let's let's go let's go into that. First of all, uh, deer proof, rabbit proof. There's no such thing. You know, so I've got a list here at the garden center called deer and rabbit proof resistive <laughs> plants, and with some techniques on on uh, how to keep them out. Uh, but really, it's it's resistive. A uh, deer, I mean, they're kind of like cattle. They've got two stomachs, and so they've got a front and a back. And sometimes they're eating things they normally don't eat. And they're going, oh, this is uh, it. The texture's good, and then it gets, then it starts to go. Oh, wait a minute, that doesn't, that doesn't make me feel so good. I think I'll just move on. So so graze things, even though they're not really eating it. They're just bored, or they're trying things before they eat it all the way to the ground. But uh, really, the only way to keep deer and rabbit out of the yard truly is uh, a fence of some sort. So physical barrier. I found that, uh, you know, you read all the uh, articles and they say, eight foot fence. That's a minimum you should be on. No HOA is going to let an eight foot fence in there. It's just too big. It's too expensive. I found that a six foot generally works pretty well too. So six foot will keep them out. Uh, I mean, elk and deer. So so we've got some elk in Skull Valley. Now towards Baghdad, there's another herd out there. And of course, you folks up in that, as you go up the elevation towards Williams, that's when you started to get into elk country, Payson, elk country. So strawberry, elk country. So about six foot. And I think what it is, they can jump it. But you know, again, remember, they don't have health insurance. There's no, there's no uh, emergency room to help them. If they break a leg, it's over. And so they're kind of cautious. They'd rather not. If there's anything around besides that, they'll do that. And so a fence, I've had good luck with the electric fence, especially on with rabbits and with javelina. Really keeps them out. About a javelina, I've got a, a, a wire, a foot off the ground, it's 12 volts. It's not going to electrocute them. Little piglets, they're so cute. They're not going to be harmed. Uh, but it just shocks them. They're going to go, whoa, what's going on? Uh, the whole herd freaks out and runs off and they don't come back. So it just spooks them. Uh, in uh, in the orchard, we had we, I raised my family in Skull Valley. And so they grew up on ranches and farms. We farmed orchards and barns and you know, 4-H projects, all that kind of stuff. And so down there, we'd put a new, let's say, an apple tree. That's one of their favorites. Deer love fruit trees. They're just so sweet. The, the, the wood is sweet. The fruit is sweet. Everything, the leaves, del- delicious. They like them. So we plant a new tree. Of course, they're noticing right away going, hey, there's a new plant. Let's go try it. We'd put a, a just regular field fence. You know, the typical six foot buried in the ground, pounded in the ground, down to about chest high, put field fence around it. But here's the insider tip. We're in horse country and deer, the way you keep horses or meat in your barn, you know, they they like to nibble on stuff. You put electric fence right there or you keep them or you keep uh, any more cattle, you keep them in with electric fence. So the deer, they know those little yellow insulators, 
well, I'll get zipped if I get near those. I get that's like painful. I don't want that. And so we'd put a, a dummy insulator on that. There's one they make at the end of those fence posts. We just put one on just four corners, put one on it, never put a wire in it, never, never electrified it. Just we you they know it's a scarecrow effect. They know don't don't reach in, try to get in there. We'd let the tree grow up until deer we'd let them prune it up to about where they can stand, about six, six and a half foot high. And then that's the perfect level to prune a fruit tree in an orchard because now you can drive the tractor, you can kind of kind of move things around. It's perfect. So that's kind of it's so we keep it there for two, three years, push the growth, and then, then take that field fence off and all was well. Um, repellents. There's actually a, a, some scented things, granular and uh, granular works really good in a flower bed to keep rabbits off. They get the, the castor bean oil or the, the garlics, the, the rotten eggs. They're different. They're all organic, but they get it on their feet and they kind of preen and go, oh, this is what just happened. Don't go over there. Bad things happen every time. So repellents work really well. And then there's some that you spritz on the foliage. They're organic. They, they really work out. Of course, your grandparents, they use blood meal. They just sprinkle blood meal around the yard. Good fertilizer. But the reason they did that was fertilize. And then as a repellent, uh, when when rabbits or, or uh, when, when things smell blood, they're going, oh, my gosh, my, my neighbors just got it here. I can smell the blood. Something's going on. Stay away. It spooks them out. And so they kind of it gets a period. The problem is you have to reapply it pretty often. It's the same with human hair. You hear that's an old wives tale. I don't find it works that well, but if you can get enough, maybe. But they smell the hair. They go, humans are here. Be careful. Guards up. Problem is, it fades off so quick. It just, that hair smell, the human hair smell, goes away faster. So scented soaps, you'll hear uh, ivory springs sometimes. Generally, it works. Sort of. I think they get used to the smell is what happens. And so they keep moving on. Really, you're better off putting plants they just don't like. And start with herbs, herbs, so rosemary and lavender, and now all the herbal families, times, generally speaking, animals don't like herbs. I know we do, but they don't like that scent and that smell and the oils. Doesn't sit well with them. So cat mint, uh, parsley, uh, sages, they don't, tansy, all those herbal things they don't like. Uh, you can walk your neighborhood too and see, see certain plants. So walk your neighborhood, you'll find they don't eat for scythia bushes. So they're right there in the neighborhood where that herd of eight deer are, are roaming around. They don't bother those. So hollies and junipers, uh, the natives like Mahonia and Cotoneaster, uh, they don't eat those. So Nandina, you folks from California, heavenly bamboo. They don't, it's a beautiful plant, but it's got a sap in it. They don't like to eat. And so kind of watch some of those. We can help guide you through some of that, help you. Uh, trees, we're finding some. They're starting to scrape the bark off the trees so they can, especially uh, of tasty trees like, like aspens, cottonwoods, sycamores, maples. They can kind of rub the, the bucks will rub the velvet off their antlers. And then sometimes in the winter, they'll just eat the, the bark underneath the, the, the wood just underneath that cambium layer underneath the bark is super sweet. That's the living tissue. And they like to peel that off and eat it sometimes. If you see that, come see us right away. Uh, before it calluses over, uh, you can spray it with some some black paint or, or pruning paint is what we call it. You spray it right there. And then we wrap it with a with a tree wrap. There's a brown one that looks very natural. You'll you're basically bandaging that that plant to keep the deer off to to repair the damage. And then to keep the deer off, they're not going to mess with that um, that that tree wrap stuff. So the tree likes it and it keeps the deer away. Quite honestly, I. If you, if you do have deer in the area, they're going to be, they, and you notice them going after your tree trunks or lower branches, I had really good luck. Now, this is not in any book, but it's, per, this. my name's Ken. We're just gardeners sharing over the airwaves. This works really well in, in, where I had elk and deer. Now, they're eating on my walnut tree. Oh, my gosh. I couldn't keep them off. So, I took some, some bird netting. The regular old bird netting you put over a, an apple tree to keep the birds off. So peaches, keep the birds off. I just lightly floated that three times around the trunk, staple gunned it. So it's like this floating netting, but they didn't mess with that. They were not interested. It took the pressure off immediately. And so they didn't bother. And I couldn't see it. So some of these, and you know, they make deer fencing put around it. It's orange. It's ugly. 
I don't want to see that in my garden or around my trunks. Bird netting, you don't even see it. It doesn't, doesn't hurt the plant. So just some, some insider tips. Come in and ask for our deer and rabbit resistant plant list. We can give you the grand tour, show you. If you got a lot of pressure, we can show you how to kind of compensate for that. But you can have nice gardens and be in this wildland interface where lots of animals roam around. You can have beautiful gardens. Be right back after this. Grow extraordinary succulents and cactus indoors. Water succulents are easy with lots of shapes, sizes, and colors. Whether you're looking for a small cactus for an office desk or a huge statement succulent in your living room, we have the perfect plant. So what are you waiting for? Visit Waters Garden Center in Prescott today or watersgardencenter.com to find the perfect succulent for your home and office. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert, Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. Now, I touched on it just at the beginning of the show, but I, I think I should give it a little bit more justice, a little bit more uh, deeper. And so and come in and ask for the, the handout. It's, it's right there. I'll go, anyone that's a horticulturalist here at the garden center, the water guide is on the back of their card because it's the number one question we get. And we're getting, we're getting a, this is really for you new folks. The rookies are just, just new to the area. You get tricked into turn the irrigation off in November. Uh, and, and and don't water again until next April. And we have some serious dry spells through winter. If a plant is dry and it goes through serious cold, especially when the drop when it drops from like 60 to 19 degrees, that's going to mess with plants. And so we get what we call winter kill or winter burn. The tips of the branches die back. Actually, the entire plant can die off if you're not careful. So you don't want your plants to go dry through winter. Now, how often do you need to water to keep them happy and healthy? Now they're, 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 they're dormant. So they've, they've lost from their leaves. The deciduous plants are now naked or, or going to be here within a month. The last of the, the last Bradford pear will drop its leaves. And so things are dormant, but the sap is still flowing. The plant is truly not, it's in hibernation. It's not actually like just frozen. So it's, it's in stasis. So it still needs some uh, nutrients, some water. How often? So about twice a month. Give it a deep soak. Well, well my landscaper turned my irrigation off. Well, break, do what your grandparents did. Drag a hose out there on a nice day. You know you need some sunshine. Go take care of your plants, especially the new things. So a brand new, let's say, spruce tree or, or a new fruit tree you just planted in the spring or new crepe myrtle. Uh, 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 another one's our, our autumn sage. Anything with the herbal sage the salvia names, they need some care. They don't want to go dry through winter. I know they're drought hardy, but they're not impenetrable to, to, to cold. The, the cold is what keeps the antifreeze flowing up and down that tree. And so when they get real dry, they'll just go, okay, that's, we're dry. I can't keep everything alive. Let the, let the, the branches, the ends go. And if it gets bad enough, you go right back to the heart of the plant, kills the plant. We saw quite a bit, even, even I lost some autumn sage last year. So this is a real cute little knee high, uh, hardy shrub has red flowers, not always red, red, purple, pinks kind of flower. The hummingbirds love them. They're, they're, they're a very popular seller. Uh, probably one of the number, definitely one of the top 10 shrubs that we sell here at the garden center, at least here in Prescott, because it's so pretty, hardy, and the hummingbirds love it. Butterflies love it. But it can be kind of sensitive when the roots are real small, it can dry a little faster and so in winter, that's when you lose them. So next spring, if you lost any last winter, that's probably what it was. It just got a little bone dry, got some serious cold, and it just vaporized. Easy recovery for 10 bucks, you can get a new one. But gardeners, you know how hard that is to watch a plant die. These are like puppy dogs. They're in the ground. You don't want them to suffer. And by just watering them a couple times a month, That'll be enough, especially the bigger or the evergreen thing. So if you got a big maple tree you just planted or a cluster of, of aspens, I know they're dormant. 
just water my, you know, a, a couple times a month. That's enough to keep them super happy. You will get better growth next spring if you do that. If you don't, they can be stunted. The leaves can be smaller. Things happen. Uh, evergreens, especially your broadleaf evergreens. So red tip photinias, euonymus, your cotoneasters, hedges. You really want to water those a couple times a month. That'll keep them where they they flush with new growth. It'll keep them greener. Just take the hose out and give them a good, give them a drink, or or turn the irrigation on. Let it run uh, for a couple. Now you're not playing with it. You're not playing with the time frame. So if you water 90 minutes in the summer, that's how often you water. You're just changing the cycle. How often do I do it? So every 14 days, that's enough. Keep them going. That's how you water plants in your yard. Your yard will turn heads with stunning evergreen shrubs from Waters Garden Center. Waters grows greener shrubs for year-round interest, as well as blooming shrubs for pops of color in spring. Attract birds with a tall privacy hedge and the berries that follow. Plus, winter evergreens are easier to grow than other plants. No matter your landscape, we have the perfect shrubs for a greener winter. Visit Waters Garden Center in Prescott or online at watersgardencenter.com.